Sometimes I don't believe the things that I say You and me, meant to be Like the blood that I bleed from my heart Hello and welcome back to the channel Heart friends and fellow students of the great mystery I'm Lily Walker and I am a religious educator, a homeschool teacher, and an astrologer. And I have a specialization in religious studies, philosophy, art, and history. And today I'm here to talk with you about an important concept for both the advanced astrologer and sort of a person who's not even all that interested in astrology, but is interested in sort of a pantheistic um, um, view or understanding of the cosmos around us and how it shows up in the 3D manifest reality. Um, our topic today is going to be orienting ourselves under the dome and bringing the um, practice of astrology off the page and into the immediate environment, okay, and into the 3D environment. And we're going to begin that study um, by talking about the four directions and you're going to learn how to mark the four directions and where they are in your environment and how that relates to the angles um, and the four angle you know angles of astrology um, we're going to talk about um, the time of day how to use the the direction or the angle of the sun to tell both the time of day and the direction in the environment um, we're going to talk about the difference between location-based houses or coordinate house systems and the zodiacal house system and sort of where that discrepancy is and kind of talk at that for just a minute. Um, we're going to talk about how to locate the ecliptic in the sky and where that is in your immediate environment in relation to the four cardinal directions. We're going to talk about um, how to understand the 12 divisions of the sky. So the 12 divisions of the 360 degree circles or the house system and how that um, rolls out in the environment and also how it, it stands as an imprint in the opposite direction. Um, we're going to talk about um, the planetary joys and understanding where that you know system comes from and how to kind of understand that better. We're going to talk about um, understanding how the movement of the ecliptic happens, like the movement of the ecliptic and the importance of the sunrise imprint with relation to how the houses move and uh, you know how the wheels move in the sky. And we're going to understand not only what it means to go backwards on the wheel but how to actually move backwards on the wheel. So those are kind of two different things and a little bit of an advanced topic to kind of round it out at the end, okay? So um, let's get started. So some of the things that you might need or want to have um, ready for this lesson are a pencil and paper, because we're talking about sort of things that moving in the sky and sometimes it's helpful to write, to write down some notes or write something down in order to draw it out for yourself. Um, or you might want a compass or if you have you know, your phone, you, there's a compass on your phone and also um, like a sky view app, one of like this guy. So where you can see the stars and find the equator line and find the uh, various constellations, okay? that will be helpful. And if you'd like, it might also be helpful to have, or at least have in your mind, what an astrology chart looks like on a printed piece of paper, where you could go to astro.com and put in your own chart information, and you can kind of see what your chart looks like on a printed piece of paper. Uh, because this is, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about the difference of how to translate this into the 3D environment, okay? And so um, the first thing that we want to talk about is how to mark the four cardinal directions. So if you use your compass on your phone, or if you have a compass, you know, in some other form, you know, you the first thing that you want to notice is in the room that you're in and studying in, where are the four cardinal directions? So where is south, where is north? where is east and where is west. And it also might additionally be helpful if you don't have this memorized um, to place like four different colored rocks or something in those four directions so that that way, as we're talking, it's easier for you to be like, okay, that's south, right? You know, uh, I happen to know that in the room that I am in, that this direction is south, 
this direction is north over here towards the chalkboard is east and on the far side of the computer is west, all right? And so um, I find that when I try to think about these things that it often is best if I sit facing south, okay? Because the reason for this is that when you notice, okay, of course we know that the sun rises in the east every morning, right? And it, when it reaches its highest point in the sky and culminates in the sky in the afternoon, it is in the southern corner, okay? And so sometimes it's easier when I'm thinking about the ecliptic, you know, and watching how the ecliptic moves in these four directions in my house, you know, the highest point of the ecliptic is in the south. And so when I'm looking at it on the Skyview app and things, it's easier for me to see it in that direction. So, um, in this understanding then, the east would be on your left, the west would be in, on your right, and you know, south would be in front of you and north would be behind you, okay? Now, um, so we know that the sun travels a path, you know, rises in the east, culminates in the south, sets in the west, and is reborn in the, at midnight and you know, in the north. And it inscribes a circle around us and, you know, based on these four cardinal directions, right? Now, we also know that these are the four angles, okay? So, you know, in astrology, we call, you know, the, the, where the sun rises in the east, that is the ascendant, okay? And where it culminates in the highest point of the sky in the south, that is the midheaven. And where it sets in the west, that is the descendant. And where it's reborn at the lowest point, uh, in you know below us or behind us is the IC. Okay, and so those are you know the four major angles in astrology, and they're very important. So angles are extremely important. There are like where like where the force. Um, if it's angular, it means it's very forceful and it's going to show up. Um, uh, what did somebody say recently? It was like newsworthy, you know, like you, it, you'll hear news about these things. They're newsworthy because they are, you know, they really show up if, if it's on an angle. Um, and so these angles are very important. And so we think about not only, so we have this circle, you know, that connects these four angles, right? And so not only is this like, um, the ecliptic, right, the path that the sun travels, the circle, but it's also a clock, okay? So the sun rises, you know, we're going to use sort of like um, equinox times, right? Like the, the most standard, you know, times for these, these times to just for the uh, example. And we will additionally get into how this varies by season. But, uh, you know, at, at the equinox times, the sun rises directly in the east at, say, 6 a.m., okay? rises at 6 a.m., is at about a 45 degree at 9 a.m., it is overhead at, at noon, and then <clears throat> again at the 45 degree angle about 3 p.m., sets at 6 p.m., down at the 45 degree angle at 9 p.m., and you can see this on the, on the wheel that I have, uh, at 9 p.m., it, it's at the lowest point at midnight, comes up at, um, you know, starts, begins rising up at 3 a.m., at the 45 degree angle, and then again at 6 a.m., you know, at the ascendant part, okay? So we can see as a clock that, um, that the, you know, that the sun crosses these angles around these times. And this is helpful to us to understanding the meaning of these angles, okay? So when the sun rises on the ascendant, you imagine you wake up and you come to consciousness and come into your body and mind, you're like, oh, here I am, you know, I'm awake, okay? And so, you know, we know that the ascendant often uh, relates to the our personality, who we are, the face we present to the world and our body, you know, like us, our personality. And um, the midheaven is where, you know, the sun is at noon. And you imagine this is like lunchtime. Right. And think about back when you were in high school or, you know, and when you would go to the lunch table. Right. Like this was the height of the energy of the day. It was often the time when your public reputation was, you know, you know, this was a, an issue at this point. Right. Like who we are, in, you know, at, under the noonday sun. And it's the point uh, the MC is like the height of our career and public reputation. All right. And then we notice that the dis the descendant where the sun falls 
right, is where the sun is falling for the day. It's going down. And so this is the point um, where the, de the descendant is often, uh, it's also the point where we move into sort of personal time and domestic matters, you know, at this at sunset, right? We, and this is a time of partnerships. It's a house of partnerships. Um, the sixth house, though, is a house, a health house, right? Where we're thinking about, you know, um, what, the thing, people that work for us and uh, what's working, serving us, right, you know, but it's it's actually the time of, of the sun's fall. And so this is the time of the sun setting. And so, you know, you notice that like um, sixth and eighth house sort of issues are more about um, fear, death, and these sorts of things, right, where the sun is falling for the day. Um, when we get to the IC uh, and, and the midnight point, this is often <clears throat> understood as the rebirth point of the sun and sort of where we alchemize in this 9 p.m. quarter, right? We sort of alchemize and there's like a death and there's a rebirth process that happens. And it's sort of like uh, the resources that we have with us like are and are digging up for the next go, the next day. Like what's, you know, what resources do we have at our, our disposal and sort of this is our deep grounding point, right? And so that would be the IC. And so these four angles get their meaning uh, that we, you know, that we understand what they mean from the way that they show up when the sun crosses those angles, okay? And so um, I also want to help you to see that, um, that the time of day and the direction, um, like the when when we notice what angle the sun is at, okay, when we measure this the, the angle of the sun, we can tell not only what time of day it is, but what direction we are facing, right? So you know, it de like de depending on the angle of the sun, we know what direction we're headed in. So if the sun has reached the the mid heaven and the highest point of cumulation of the day then we know that that is south, right? And so this is how the Vikings and various seafarers, right, used to navigate before we had things like this, right? And, and so, um, you know, so they, could, they would know what time of day it was and they would use a shadow as well to measure on a sundial, right? Um, but you could tell also the direction that you were headed in based on, you know, knowing it's, you know, what time of day it is and measuring that angle of the sun. You know, if, it was, if the sun was at a 90 degree angle in the sky, then you knew it was midday and you were headed directly south, okay? So we can tell more than just the time of day. We can also tell the direction from the angle of the sun, all right? And so basically we know from that that this is exactly how we pull astrology off the page and this wheel off the page and into the environment. Like it's like a testimony that we know that we're doing it right. Okay. And so, um, so yes, when the sun is at its highest point for the day, it's not only noon, it's also the midday hour of that season, you know, or whatever the midday hour of that season is, but it's also south. Okay. So we can consider these angles from two perspectives though, okay? So we know that like the cardinal four cardinal directions, you know, are sort of based on, you know, if we were to send up from our heart, you know, a vertical line and a horizontal line straight out on either side, that this would be a cardinal cross, right? And that the four directions of, of the hemispheres or, you know, of the globe, probably <laughs> of the, of the earth are are based on you know those four cardinal directions and that sort of cross that our heart and body makes okay but we also know that the sun doesn't actually rise in the exact east every day of the year okay it rises directly in the east at both of the equinoxes so at spring equinox and at fall equinox these are the even periods the equal periods and that is where the sun rises directly in the east and sets in the west but as we move towards the summer solstice the sun will move towards the south okay so that the place where the sun rises will, will start to rise a little bit in the southeast in corner instead of directly east, okay? 
so the sun will rise a little bit in the southeast in the summer months. And in, or it was that the winter? Yeah, south in the winter and towards the north in the summer. So if this, if, if this is directly east, if it's, if it's summertime, it's going to be rising a little bit to this back behind me, to the, you know, to, towards the, towards the, the north. Okay. And if it's, if it's winter time, it's going to be rising a little bit to the south of that east point. Okay. And setting the same, right? So the ecliptic moves just a little bit. Okay. In reference to the exact up and down cardinal cross of our location. All right. And so this um, discrepancy is where we get. Um, the discrepancy between the cardinal cross as where you are in the season and more so um, based on your location, right? Because the angle of the ecliptic is also different based on your longitude, okay? Or the one that goes horizontally, not up and down. So based on how high you are on the earth or low below the equator, you know, that tilt of the ecliptic is different. So if I were at the equator, it would be more of a 90 degree thing going up and down and around me year round. But because I am, you know, up at a 45 degree longitude, that the angle is tilted a bit. So I'm pretty high up. I'm in Oregon. And so, you know, that angle of the ecliptic, it does, it definitely, the sun definitely does not rise, it does not culminate directly overhead it culminates every day you can see it up over this tree and it's definitely at an angle okay and so there's a little bit of a difference between those two and trying to work out this difference is where we get the the sort of discrepancies or the differences in the various house systems okay because we can imagine that if we have the four directions set the four cardinal points and the four angles set that we can inscribe a circle, a 360 degree circle all the way around, right? And then we can divide that circle into 30 degree pi segments or houses, okay? So you've got the 12 houses around you, okay? And then the question then becomes, you know, if the, you know, the sun is culminating over here at an angle, then that is actually the midheaven where it culminates. But directly south, you know, is actually a little bit, you know, moved over towards the left here, you know, and so there's a little bit of a discrepancy there as where you would call the cusp of that house, would you call it directly on the midheaven, or would you call it, you know, at directly south, and that is the discrepancy that we're working with trying to figure out these house systems, and so people have different answers for that, okay, um, now, why would it matter, like, to you? Like, why, you know, why would that, I mean, of course, there are other reasons why it would matter, but in a very simple answer, why it would matter is in something like augury, which is trying to divine signs and symbols and omens via, um, like, birds you see in the sky or some other um, manifestation that appears. A firework goes off in the sky or you see a comet or something. And the question is, what house was that in? Where is it? And you know, if if it is, um, if I see, you know, a flock of birds here, you know, rising up from the east and culminating towards the south, then I know that is an, an an omen that's coming in, right? It's something coming in and about to, you know, create a boom. But if I see it, you know, far over in the western corner, you know, the more toward or even, you know. I, I wouldn't be able to see below the horizon, but imagine it was an omen that you could see, you know, in, in the south, in the northern corner, you know, then you would know that it's an omen that's moving out, right? Or like, say you were trying to choose a king, right? You would want one that's coming in, not one that's falling out, right? Like the one falling out would be the one that's not gaining prominence, okay? So if you're trying to... Um, divine symbols like this that you actually see in the environment, then knowing which house it is in is important, okay? And so, um, right, so the difference would be 
like say there's this flock of birds and you're trying to decide what house it's in, right? So if it's directly above your head in a coordinate system, then that might be like 10th or 9th house, right? So like directly overhead, you know, the MC would be directly overhead. So that would be either like 9th or 10th house up here, right? But if it's if we're looking at, you know, based on the ecliptic and the, and that, you know, the sun is is going to um but if it's summer and the sun culminates in the northeast, right? So it's going to culminate over here, then it might be more like ninth or eighth house, right? Like, you know, so it's like if the highest point is actually over here a little bit, then, you know, it, it just, it depend it, it varies a little bit depending on that. And so you would, that's why these house systems are, you know, why there's some argument over how to assign these quadrants. You know, in addition, the stars and planets were there as omens, right? And so we kind of want to try to understand which, where they were in the sky based on this house kind of system, okay? And so um, that is where those two house systems come up. And so coordinate systems are based on your, you know, your location and your, you know, cardinal directions based on your location, whereas a zodiacal house system is based only um, on the ecliptic, okay? And so it's like 30 degree segments based on the energies that move through the ecliptic. And it's actually, as we're gonna see, what crosses up over the uh, um, ascendant, okay? And in the timing. So um, let's see. Okay, so if we have the four corners and we have the four angles, then we have the circle that inscribes them and we have the 12 houses, okay? So just like, you know, we noticed how the sun rises and the times that it hits the angles, it also, you know, rises and moves through the houses like a clock, okay? And so in this respect, we see the, the houses numbered in red, okay, up here on my diagram. So first we see, you know, that the, the sun cr sunrise here crosses the ascendant in the east, and comes up to make the first house here around, you know, 6 to 8 a.m. And then second house at 9 a.m. up, you know, third house, 11-ish, 12 noon. And then we get to like the fifth house around 3 or 4 p.m. And down, you know, sixth house around 6 p.m. Down here about eighth house around 9 p.m. And, you know, and 12 midnight for between the ninth and 10th house here. And then 3 a.m. here and the 11th house. So you can see how the house is also, you know, follow that clock schedule. And, you know, if we think about it, we, we can correlate that. Okay. So first house, you know, um, you wake up and come into your mind and your body and yourself, right? Second house, you have something to eat and you sort of have your storehouse of energy for the day, right? That's resources. Um, you know, your third house, you begin to make connections and talk to people. And it's great to have, uh, you know, I was about to go into the joys, but I'm going to wait for a second on that. But, you know, you start to communicate and talk to people and it's the people that you talk to in your everyday environment. You're kind of getting your work done and getting ready to go to lunch with your, you know, homies. And then, you know, the fourth house, again, you know, dealing with, you know, um, you know, sort of, you know, being out there with your people and doing your thing and kind of getting, um, getting your project grounded for the day, kind of. And then the fifth house, you begin to see, well, the sun's starting to fall. And I only have so much time left in, in today. And, um, you know, but, you know, this is my, you know, creative time. I'm going to, you know, this is, I'm going to, you think like the pool parties happen like at 3 p.m., you know, that part of the day, it's just like really happy, you know, and, and this sort of thing. Um, the sixth house, though, you know, is um, we, re we recognize that the day is ending, right? We have to put our projects to rest or potentially, um, you know, do we have people showing up to help us push through the end kind of sixth house matters. Um, you know, seventh house, we go home, we start to make dinner with our immediate relationships and our partners, right? You know, 9 p.m. It's kind of like <clears throat> getting things done, sort of, um, you know, evening entertainment, 
um, you know, other people's money, right? So like, what do we do with our partners kind of thing? And, um, and also, you know, maybe domestic disputes and things could happen at this time. And then down to, you know, midnight, you know, and kind of going into the dream space and going far away, sending our mind far to the far journeys, right? This sort of thing. 10th house, um, you know, kind of regaining that, regaining the, I see things are reborn, we're kind of regaining our strength and like what we're about in our mission and going forward for, you know, the moving into the next day, the 11th house being La Madre so the witching hours, right, where we are playing in the astral realm with um, our soul tribe, right, and our, in our ashram and gathered, you know, with our uh, fellow servers, etc. And then 12th house being, um, you know, the time just before sunrise, right, and, and sort of, you know, getting it together to, you know, just sort of the precognitive time, things that are hidden just under the surface and getting ready to come back up, and, you know, and make another round, okay, so we can understand the house system and how we describe the houses based on this motion, um, and as I will, you know, as we're used to doing also in the reverse motion, which we will talk about. Um, but, you know, but you can see that definitely that the houses, um, you know, there is some way to describe the houses based on the forward motion of the wheel or the clockwise direction of the way that it's rolled out. Now, the planetary joys are very easy to understand from this perspective, okay, because when you come awake in the morning, it's like your first thought, best thought. That's what Chogyam Trungpa used to teach as far as for writers or creative types, like when you wake up, first thought, best thought, right about that. And so, um, you know, Mercury has his joy there. It's where we, we have good ideas. Our, we, got, we wake up with like gusto and our brain is ready to go, right? Like we wake up clear minded, like with a clear mind, right? So Mercury has his joy there. And the third house, when we're beginning to communicate, make connections and these sorts of things, it's the moon has has her joy there. And so that's where we're like embodying the dream. Like it's coming together like we want, you know, like it's serving our feelings and what we want to see like in an astral sense, like uh, the moon, right? Like, like what's showing up and becoming embodied is suits our feelings, right? It's like what we want. And so, you know, the moon has her joy there. Uh, also very, you know, social, etc. And then Venus has her joy in the fifth house, right? Which is, this is the summer sun at the pool party, like, you know, the most beautiful creative time of the day. But it's also that point of the day where we begin to realize that the sun is falling soon and that some projects may or may not make it, right? So Venus being there values, adds value to whatever it is that we're working on you know, and helps us to, you know, it's valuable, it's going to make, right, it's going to make, it's going to happen, okay, and so um, then Mars in the sixth house, right, like, that's where we have to defend the thesis, it's like the end of the workday, it either made or it didn't, and there's this big push to make it come off, right, and so Mars being there is a great ally to help us fight for it, right, and get her done, and then um, if you come into the 11th house where Jupiter has his joy, okay, so this is like increasing the astral sparklers, right? And increasing like luck and fortune and, and sort of our uh, divine philosophy and our worldview and way of seeing things based on sort of La Madrigus and La, the witching hours of that astral realm where we're kind of in uh, community with our, you know, ashram of fellow servers and our teachers, etc., in the astral realm. And then um, Saturn has his joy in the 12th house, right? Because it puts the seal on that door, uh, you know, it, it, where, you know, we could backslide in, you know, into non-manifestation, like we come into manifestation at the ascendant and Saturn puts his like seal there, right? But additionally, it sort of puts a clamp down on hidden enemies or things that might rise up, right? like zombies rising up from the ground, right? Like it kind of puts a seal on that. So we see like how the planetary joys work very well in this um, clockwise moving structure of the house system right? And so um, let's see, where are we coming from that? So we understand that we move through the houses that they present in this clockwise-like direction, okay? However, we also know that when we look at a chart program or 
even if we look at the ecliptic and, you know, if you're sitting there with your sky view and you look at the ecliptic in your environment, right? It, it reads backwards, okay? Like the ecliptic is written right to left. And the house systems, when we look at a piece of paper, we read counterclockwise as well. It's written right to left. Now, there is a strong tendency in most Westerners to read left to right, okay? So if you're like me and sort of have this, I, it's just a thing, right? It's very hard. I'm very linear in that way. Uh, I, you know, I have an INTP, which means I'm thinking, right? If I was an F, I might go easily, more easily right to left. But left to right, like I'm very, you know, like very meth methodical like that in my thinking, very linear, although I'm extremely creative and sensitive in these things too, and artistic and more right-brained, I still tend to do school really well. And that is like a left brain kind of activity. We read left to right. And so for people like me, or if you have that strong tendency, or for pretty much anyone, because we all read left to right, and it's a real um, ingrained habit in us, um, it's difficult to let your mind move in both directions. However, it's essential for astrologers to create and, and work on and practice this sort of uh, flexibility of being able to read in both directions. And it also pinpoints a very important aspect of how the physics are working here, okay? Because there's a reason why it's written right to left, and there's a reason why the house system is presented in a counterclockwise direction, okay? And that reason very much has to do with the importance of the angles in the sunrise imprint, okay? So when the sun rises for the day, the beginning of the wave happens, and the four angles and the imprint that they make is set at that moment, okay? And so where we see that the IC and the information that we get, like the tone that we take on from that angle is very important in the third and fourth house, okay? Whereas uh, the MC and, and our career and public reputation and, and, you know, kind of who we are and how, you know, our honors, right, are very important in the ninth and tenth houses, right? And so... Um, what we end up seeing is that these angles are very important in the imprint. Um, however, it's kind of what it's kind of like. It's kind of like a bones structure, okay? Where like the um, the clockwise direction and the houses labeled in red, right? One, two, three, four, five. This sort of bones structure and the four angles are static. They are, a, they are the bones of this like structure. And then it's kind of like a Play-Doh mold, right? Like one of those things where you squeeze it and the Play-Doh comes out, right? And, and the Play-Doh mold, the squeezer thing, is the, the bones of this thing, okay? And the Play-Doh that we put in is the sine wave or the sunrise imprint, okay? We put that into the bones and we squeeze and it starts to come out. Okay, and in this way, the ecliptic, uh, the ecliptic and the sine wave stuck in here is stuck stacked in here in a right to left direction, but it comes out and straightens itself out when you squeeze it out. Okay, and so let me show you how this works on the wheel. Okay, so the idea here is that it's almost like there is a spinner here, like from a wheel of life game where you can turn this and twist this house structure, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Counterclockwise house structure, that you twist it out and roll it out to the right. You roll it out in a clockwise direction. And what's very important is this ascendant line, right? So when we turn this and squeeze out the first house, right? It, the sun is right here and this red first house, right? The sun is here when we squeeze out the first house. The sun then moves to here and we squeeze out the second house. The second house crosses over this uh, ascendant line. So in a sense, like essentially what's being activated in, in the um, house structure, it is what, as it crosses the ascendant line, right? 
And, and so that's the energy that's on tap, right? When we, when it crosses over and where the sun is, is the house that it's in, right? It's like, it shows us what's coming out. Okay. And so then you, you squeeze it further. And when the sun gets here in the 10th house, you're squeezing out the third house energy. Okay. And, and onwards all the way around until you un, unrolled this wheel. Okay. And so in this way, we understand that the sunrise imprint printed in a counterclockwise direction, right? You know, is, is kind of like energy in a bank, right? It's like a bank of energy that gets this imprint. And then we spend it throughout the day as we turn, as we turn it and it goes through the houses and we squeeze it out, right? We spend that energy in the bank. Okay. And so um, let's see. I just want to make sure I'm hitting all of these things. So, you know, I, I have in here just saying again that it's this is tricky stuff, right? But the astrologer has to get familiar with being able to let these things move in both directions and move their mind in both directions because this is actually how it works, right? Um, let's see if I have this book here is an excellent book for trying to understand this material, right? And so she talks a lot about this and, and will help you, Deborah Holding, the houses, temples of the sky. She will help you to understand the importance and, and a lot more about all of this. Um, but, and, you know, in addition, I can tell you that like, you know, when I'm trying to work through it myself, like on paper and stuff, there are times when this really starts spinning for me and I can't, I'm like out on a ledge and I, it's just like all spinning. Right. And, um, you know, I have my my Mercury in um, in Aquarius in the, at the 29th degree. Right. So and in Gemini and, and Moon and Mars, you know, in the seventh house. And I'll just get like frantic because it's like a catalog of information. It's just sparking so quickly. And I have to reach out to someone to help let, have them like help talk me off of this ledge and stop it from spinning because I can't verify a fact you know what I mean it's like suddenly don't know anything and um and I'll often reach out to my friend Gary Caton who's been wonderful at helping me to try to every time that happens he like helps to talk me down off the ledge and basically the answer every time is to remember that south stays south that does not move okay so you know there's this bones structure that does not move is is the answer right and that what moves is that play-doh or the sine wave that we're squeezing through that bone structure all right now you know and this has to do with the four quadrants of the sky as well and the fact that i should have probably written it on here but the first quadrant is air the second quadrant fire the third quadrant earth and the fourth quadrant over here water Right. And so working with the quadrant, you know, those quadrants and the triplicities and all sorts of these things, you have to move in the red direction. OK, but you're looking at a chart that's in the blue direction. OK, and so you have to be able to translate and move both ways. And so that hence the importance of this video. And so additionally, like to advanced astrologers, this is very interesting, especially to esoteric astrologers, because you'll often hear it said, what does it mean to go backwards on the wheel? Okay. So, um, you know, and it's, it's a really good question. It's not exactly clear. And even when you read, you know, the Alice Bailey works, like it's not exactly clear what is meant by going backwards on the wheel. There are different ways of seeing it. Now the answer, um, you know, I've asked Philip Lindsay and, um, someone else but definitely philip Lindsay answered me and said was really kind and sent me some really good information and going backwards on the wheel means going in the counterclockwise direction because the wheel that is being talked about is the wheel of our clock is the wheel of our rising right and we watch the sun rising and going around in a clockwise direction going backwards on the wheel is going in a counterclockwise direction okay but we know that the ecliptic is already written in a counterclockwise direction, right? You know, so, so in this way, right, we see that the imprint is already in a, a counter, the imprint is in a counterclockwise direction, right? So we can understand that going backwards on the wheel 
is going in a counterclockwise direction according to the blue house structure. But that doesn't tell us how to actually move backwards on the wheel, okay? It just tells us which direction is backwards on the wheel. And how we actually move backwards on the wheel is through the spending motion, okay? So you move backwards on the wheel by one, recognizing the way that this is moves and spins, right? So you recognize that, that, you know, that you're actually moving in this direction as you're moving in this direction, okay? So as you're moving clockwise, you're actually moving counterclockwise. You know, you're spending counterclockwise, you know? And so um, I probably switched those words because I'm saying spending clockwise and it's in the bank counterclockwise, right? So just recognizing the way these move, right? And that you're, that how you're spending it is recognizing is part of going backwards on the wheel, but actually moving backwards on the wheel means with attention and in intention, recognizing where you're getting your money from, you know, and how this energy spends, okay? So the counterclockwise direction, the blue numbers on this screen and the bank, it's very interesting, right? It's blue shift. It moves back to source. It moves inwards towards the one and it's considered a sort of entropy, okay? Now that is, you know, how, of course, if we're moved back, go backwards on the wheel, go towards the one, go towards the source, right? But how do you actually do that is by moving for, you know, spending the energy with intention forward on the wheel. So it's in the red shift. So it's what we do with the karma and, the, and you know, this is like a karmic bank of energy and it's how we manage our money as we spend it and what, what we do with it, that really is how we move backwards on the wheel, right? It's by moving forwards with intention and awareness, okay? And I would argue that it's all about um, growing our rows, right? And our offering to offer to the fellow travelers around us. And what do we have, like kind of like a brownie gathering, sunshine gathering, where everybody brings a little present to share, you know, like friendship gifts, and you bring like all these little crafts, and you pass out one to all the new friends you meet, right? Like we need our rose, you know, and we grow that rose as an offering to spirit. And it's often the gifts that we were given, right? We were given these gifts in order to cultivate them as gifts for spirit, in order to give away to all the other travelers who are here walking with us on the path. Okay, so, um, and that's my understanding, at least where I am at right now in my practice with how to, what does it mean to go backwards on the wheel and how to actually move backwards on the wheel. So um, I hope that you found this um, talk engaging and that you learned something here. Uh, I think that this information is helpful, not only to astrologers and even advanced astrologers, because it's a very advanced topic, um, but it's also helpful to everyone, right? Because of this um, pantheistic, um, you know, the way that we encounter the cosmos and everything around us and um, trying to communicate with that environment, try to communicate with spirit and ourselves in that way in order to understand the arising and what's happening, right? So you see a bunny rabbit scamper across in uh, the yard in, in the southwest corner you know, that would be like over here, right? Then you would know, like you would be able to deduce information based on that, uh, you know, like, so not only is it a rabbit symbol for rabbit medicine, right? But it's also has to do with, you know, the, this fire quadrant up here, you know, the 3 p.m. energy and, and the falling of the sun, the, you know, preparing that project, you know, does it have Venus's luck? Or, you know, are you going to be afraid of it? Because rabbit's often about fear, right? Are your fears going to get in the way of you believing that you can get it done? You know, um, you know, watch that rabbit scamper and take a moment to think, hmm, maybe, um, maybe I need to pull up some confidence, right? You know, or something like this, or, you know, or other symbols and signs that might appear. Uh, it's helpful to understand, you know, 
how the astrological wheels are actually presenting in our environment. It's not just a theoretical study. It's actually embodied practice. And, um, and it's something that we moderners, people in the modern era, and potentially ever, always, as long as we've been writing and on paper, right, as long as we have this um, real importance that we ascribe to the written word and, and moving left to right in that way, right, that sort of rational way of, of approaching the world, as long as that's our default, you know, it's something, it's, this is, reminder is of great benefit for us because we, we have a tendency to be in 2D and on the page and in theoretics. And this sort of uh, practice brings it into warm blooded, you know, life. It's, it brings it into practice instead of just theory. And on that note, I think that's a great, um, a great sort of thing to bring forward as Mars is here and Leo opposing Saturn right now, because uh, Leo is all about practice and bringing things into the warm blooded real life, your heart sense as, as opposed to the cold theoretics of, you know, how it works out on paper. So, um, so thank you for watching and uh, please do like and subscribe. That really helps me out. And, um, you know, feel free to share this video if you feel so inclined, but mostly I just appreciate you being here. Thanks for being part of the community and uh, for spending time with me. I appreciate your comments and uh, look forward to meeting and engaging with you soon. So until then, um, like I always say, we are the light of the world, right? Like it's up to us to bring our light to the world. And that's really, you know, so important for us to light it up because in resonance, it lights other people up, right? And it doesn't take any of our energy, right? We just shine that light and it lights up those around us, okay? So it's so important for us to, um, to sort of be good family and be leaders in that way and to be kind and to play our notes and to find the others. Love you guys. Talk to you soon. Bye.